A few days later, it rained heavily. Radiana put her hand out to feel the blissful coolness. She spent several minutes just admiring how the drops slowly dripped from her hand, but Gino was not so optimistic. He stood next to her and grumbled that the rain wouldn't stop. His thoughts were not here at that moment. They were with his master. Magus was also concerned about his guests. He said that in such a downpour, it would be extremely difficult to come down the mountain, so he had something for the young people. He took out a box with some shining stones. While Radiana was looking at the strange stones, Magus explained that they were dried amber, which has the ability to retain heat. Finally, Magus advised the young girl that she should not let them touch her. Radiana thanked Magus for his good advice and his wise guidance. Magus added that the young lady should act arrogantly, as they had rehearsed, so that no one would have any doubts about her background. He was glad to meet Radiana and wished her good luck. All the way home, Gino was worried about Prince Orazio. He couldn't understand why he was so sad, because he knew perfectly well that they were returning home today. The valet was immersed in his heavy thoughts and walked quickly, in a hurry to get to the palace as soon as possible. He only warned the girls to watch their step because the road was slippery. Radiana was also thinking all along the way about how the prince's mood was related to the weather conditions. And not finding an answer, she decided that they could not understand the gods anyway. Radiana caught herself thinking that she still wanted to get to know Orazio Lumen more thoroughly. The only question on her mind was why he had decided to make her immortal. Outside, the weather was getting worse. Thunder, lightning, rain. Such incredible discharges made her head spin. Nika could no longer stand such a weather storm. The valet felt that the prince did not know when to stop, so he decided to rush to his aid. Gino sped up his pace as much as possible. The girls could barely keep up with him. They asked him to walk slowly, but Gino kept going fast. Finally, they came to the door of the Tesca Palace. The valet ordered the nymph to take Radiana to the bathhouse and clean her up, and he would visit Orazio in the meantime. When the girls were inside, they could breathe a sigh of relief. Finally, they could dry off and get warm. They had been lacking warmth during the last hours of the journey. When Radiana passed by the windows, she noticed that she could see the prince's temple. The young girl noticed that the prince's temple glowed a strange bright red color. So, she decided to ask her maid if the glow of the temple walls was somehow connected with his highness. She had never noticed this before, so she was curious. But Nika told her not to worry about it, because they often see this light during the rains. The maid said they had better hurry. When the valet arrived at the prince's temple, he could tell by the number of pools of blood that there had been too many deaths today. He ran around the palace looking for Prince Orazio. Gino found an unconscious guard and began to slow him down, asking him where his master was and what had happened. Gino was irritated and concerned at the same time. No one answered the concerned valet, but he still ran around the palace looking for Orazio. Finally, he saw Orazio Lumen lying on the floor of the temple. Gino cursed and ran quickly to the prince. Without wasting any time, Gino immediately began to save his highness. He knew that without his help, the prince would not regain consciousness. When Orazio regained consciousness, he was glad that Gino had helped him in time. The worried valet said that at this rate, Orazio would soon be in the power of the empress. The valet did not know how to help his master, so he suggested that he visit the first prince. Gino said that he was a pure-blooded prince and should know how to deal with all this. Orazio could see that Gino was genuinely worried about him but he still said that their meeting with the first prince would not change anything. Prince Orazio recalled what had happened here during the day and told the valet that there was no court today and he was just killing everyone who came here. The prince also added that he was a real killer, so he asked Gino to kill him when he had the chance, and that was it. But the valet objected that he was not a murderer, but the almighty Judge Povius. Gino's valet insisted that Orazio immediately meet with his brother Salthus, he hurried him along so that he could return home in time for the crescent moon. But Orazio only smiled at him. The valet was left alone in His Highness's palace. There were puddles of blood everywhere. His mind wondered why the Empress was doing this to Orazio, when he just wanted a quiet life. Radiana looked out at the rain in her warm, cozy room. When she put her hand in the rain, her hand remained dry. She said that she had guessed the reason for this. The nymph was already in a hurry to treat her mistress to some delicious warm tea. She said that this palace was just full of magic, so there was nothing to be surprised about. 
Radiana asked the maid if she was going home because it was getting late. And the nymph explained that there was a heavy rainstorm today, and the valet asked her to stay until it completely subsided. Radiana asked when His Highness would come to them. The young lady knew that the nymph was afraid of the prince, but Nika answered with confidence that Orazio would not come today. Radiana was even upset. She had not expected such a confident statement from the maid. The tea was delicious and warm. It warmed the young girl, and she began to think about the prince. The maid realized that the lady needed to be left alone, so she said good night and went to the bedroom next to Radiana's. Radiana thought about him. As the rain continued outside, she realized that the prince was in a very bad mood, but she could only guess at the reasons for it. She didn't know how long, but she couldn't stop thinking about Orazio, the warmth of his touch, the spark that had sparked when they kissed. The weight of his body on hers kept coming back to her mind. Thinking about it, Radiana spilled her tea on the table when she put the cup down, and her cheeks flushed red. She herself was frightened by this reaction to the thought of His Highness. Still, Radiana could not force herself to stop thinking about Orazio. Her gaze was directed at the rain, and her thoughts were filled with only one question. When would he return to her? In the palace of Lanisha, the first prince, Saltus Lumen, was reading a book in the hall. Suddenly, Saltus felt someone's presence, but when he turned around, there was no one in the room. But the first prince's senses were not easily fooled. So he asked if it was Orazio who had come to visit him. He added that he could have sent a message and been met. Lumen did not like his brother sneaking in like a ghost. When he looked his brother up and down, he understood everything and only asked how many he had killed this time. Orazio bowed his head and replied that he had already lost count. His brother was surprised and said that less than three months had passed since the last mass execution. Lumen took his brother's hand in his own and said that there was already fresh blood on his hands. He sternly asked Orazio if he had lost his mind because it was too dangerous. Lumen said that this time it would take more than one purification to wash away all this blood, so he would pour the purest water into the Lanitia. He took his cup and began to cleanse his brother. Orazio did not even know if Saltus's powers would help him this time. The young man knew that there was too much blood on his hands. When Orazio closed his eyes and completely surrendered to the holy water, the first thing that came to his mind was Radiana. He scolded himself for having nothing else to think about at such a crucial moment. Saltus told his brother that although he was a judge, he should not forget that he was a sun prince, and the sons of the sun cannot give death to those who do not deserve it. Therefore, if Orazio continues in the same spirit, he risks losing all his spiritual energy. Therefore, if he does not want to repeat the fate of Hades and end up underground, he must stop. Saltus decided to change the subject, because it was clear that his brother was not happy to hear all this, and he asked what family the nymph with whom he had been intimate was from, because now it was the number one topic. The brother said that when he heard the rumors about Orazio's first intimacy, he even thought that his brother had united with her highness. Paltus suggested that his brother accept Avarich's offer and then think about further actions. He believed that only then would he have a chance of survival, but Orazio objected that this would not save him. It would give the Pyro's family more influence if they allied with them. Orazio then asked permission to ask one direct question, whether he wanted Caligo to inherit the throne. Saltus thought about it. He didn't know what to say. But Orazio continued without waiting for an answer. He said that when this happens, there will be no need to fear war, because even a war is not necessary for Povium to collapse under Caligo's rule. Saltus said that he was satisfied with the fact that Lanitia was ruling, and rebelling against his father would be considered treason. That is why he advised Orazio not to waste time trying to support him, but instead to think about himself. But Orazio said that in any case, he would be happy to fight back against his father. No sooner had Radiana opened her eyes in the morning than the happy valet flew into the room and shouted for her to look at the things he had managed to get for her. The sleepy young girl asked what kind of things he was talking about, and Gino explained that he had managed to get everything on Mr. Magus's list so she could start practicing right away. The young girl examined all the weapons and was satisfied that they were of good quality, but she asked the valet if he was sure that His Highness would allow her to do this. The valet said that she could neither sing nor dance, Therefore, she must learn to make silverware perfectly. Then the valet called for Nika. When the maid came closer, the valet handed her a pile of poems. 
The valet told the nymph to read those poems to Lady Radiana all the time when she was busy making silverware. The valet also told Lady Radiana that in 15 days she would be participating in a crescent moon festival as a nymph. The girl denied that she was human. The valet replied that she would have to pretend, because humans were not allowed in the celestial palace under any circumstances. And if the lie was exposed, they would all die from a lightning strike. Radiana shuddered at this message, for she had no idea that it was so serious. After a little thought, the young girl asked the valet what would happen next. Gino did not understand what she meant, so he asked her again. Radiana explained that she was wondering what would happen if everyone fell for this lease, and no one could guess that she was not human. The valet said that his highness would marry the girl his family had chosen for him, and Radiana would be free. He could not tell the girl the whole truth. She happily took his hand, and he mentally continued that when it was all over, she would simply be burned at the stake. But the valet did not have the heart to say it. Radiana looked him in the eye and asked him if he was telling her the truth. The valet was confused, so he asked her what she meant. Radiana asked if she would really be free when it was over. The valet took his hand away and coughed. He had to lie to the young girl again and said that by then his highness would not need her, so she would be free. Radiana believed the valet and was glad that she had a chance to be free. So she sincerely promised that she would make every effort to make it happen. Ten days passed since Gino brought Lady Radiana all the tools. She worked hard every day, tirelessly, so eager to get the will she wanted. The nymph was with her all the time and, as the valet had ordered, constantly recited poetry for Radiana while she worked. This day was no exception. She asked if she could repeat what she had memorized. Radiana said she would be happy to repeat the poem. She thought she had memorized twenty scrolls of it. Nika asked if the young girl could recite it from memory, or if she needed to remind Radiana first. But Radiana closed her eyes and began to recite the poem. As soon as a smile touches your lips, my heart stops. Radiana held a flower of incredible beauty that she had just made of silver in her sleeve and continued to recite the poem. She stood with her back to the nymph and did not even notice how she had disappeared. The nymph was replaced by Prince Horacio, and Radiana continued to recite the poem. A stolen glance, my heart is on fire and I am blinded by you. But before the young girl could continue the poem, she heard a familiar voice continue. Your smile is to blame for everything, and there is pain in my heart. Your image steals my words. Radiana turned around in fright and saw him. Orazio was standing behind her. He continued to quote the poem furiously, saying the following words. Your eyelids, your sharp gaze, O oh beauty. Orazio looked the young girl directly in the eyes and continued to quote, The song of the Apollo that I gave you, my love. His Highness noticed the flower of silver in the hands of the confused Radiana, and asked her if she wanted to get a job as a poet and a blacksmith at the same time. The girl just blinked her eyes. When the prince came closer and examined the silverware that Radiana had made, he said that the girl was very good at creating such masterpieces. But as soon as His Highness noticed the state of the girl's hands, he immediately noticed that he did not like it when something that belonged to him alone was damaged. He gently took her hand, which was all scratched and burned, and touched it to his cheek. Radiana was confused. The young prince told her to take care of herself and to be more careful in the future. Radiana felt a shiver run down her spine. She could feel him in every cell of her body. She had already begun to forget his dizzying scent, his oppressive presence. There was only one question in her mind. Why did he take her tools? Because without them, she would not be able to prove to everyone that she was a nymph. So the girl immediately tried to get them back. So she immediately assured the prince that there would be no more wounds and she would be extremely careful. After all, she had tried so hard for his highness. Oratsu went to the couch and sat down on it respectfully. He asked her to go on about her business and he would silently watch to see that she was safe. Radiana tried to object to his highness, but then remembered that she didn't have to show him that she wanted to live. So she set to work in silence. Orazio admired his beauty. His mind was somewhere far away from here. At first he thought about his father and how he would gladly fight back if necessary. But if Orazio were to be honest with himself, even though he had told his brother that, it didn't matter to him right now. His arguments with his father and all his relatives had become secondary since Radiana had come into his life. He thought about the young girl all the way home and could not stop doing so. 
Orazio looked closely at his beauty and tried to understand what it was about her that attracted him so much. Perhaps it was because he could not get out of his mind her delicate fingers, which were stained from weaving baskets. Or was it that he was attracted to the way she quickly wiped her mouth after finishing a juicy peach? Or perhaps it was her sweet scent that the prince could smell when he was near Radiana, while she was pretending to sleep. If you put all these little things together, and Orazio's thoughts were filled with memories of a beautiful beauty, the chaos in his mind dissipated somewhere, and he felt some strange peace. Radiana was making silverware, but her thoughts were far away. She wanted to ask Orazio why it had been raining so hard the last few days, and why His Highness was in such a bad mood. Radiana remembered a conversation with the nymph who had told her about the local customs. To get married, a prince had to spend the first night with someone, and then Her Highness would take care of his wife. Radiana recalled their first touch, and how Orazio said that it was enough for today, because she had to be on a par with him. Now all the puzzles in her head were coming together. Radiana had no idea why he had chosen her for the first night, because there were so many worthy nymphs and girls of royal blood in the heavenly kingdom, she wondered if she should end it tonight. But while she was flying somewhere far away in her thoughts, she was not paying attention to her work, and burned her hand. The young girl screamed and tried to hide the wound from the prince. Orazio, of course, noticed everything and addressed the girl by name. Radiana froze and was afraid to move. She thought that maybe everything would be fine, but Orazio had no intention of giving up. He loudly told the girl to come to him. Radiana hid her wounded arm and said that she was fine, and that small wound on her hand would heal quickly. But Orazio said in a louder tone that he could smell burning flesh, so she should come to him immediately. The girl had to come to his highness anyway. He examined her wound and stated that it was not as small as Radiana had assured him. The prince said that the arm needed to be treated immediately. He gently took her hand and brought it to his lips. As soon as his lips touched the young girl's skin, a pleasant warmth enveloped her entire body. But Orazio's attention was drawn to a strange noise outside the window. As soon as he looked through the open shutters, he saw people in black clothes flying past the palace. They were ambassadors. He immediately realized what a bad time it was. The ambassadors had phenomenal senses, and it was not difficult for them to notice the smell of burning flesh. Orazio looked at the confused beautiful woman and decided that he had to hide her human scent immediately. So he looked her in the eyes and said that they had unfinished business to finish. So now was the time. Radiana flushed red from her fingertips to the last hairs on her head. She was incredibly ashamed. She hadn't realized it would happen so soon and right here. But Orazio was not about to let things slide, so he gently picked her up and carried her to bed. When he looked at her face, he said that the color had turned puffy red and that it was most likely because she had spent a lot of time near a hot stove. The girl began to tell him that it was not because of the stove, but because of... But before she could finish, Orazio began to kiss her. As the young girl lay on the bed, she didn't know what she was supposed to do. Her confused eyes just looked at the ceiling. Orazio suggested it himself, but he wasn't sure that Radiana was ready for it. So, Orazio stood up above the bed and didn't know whether to continue or wait a little longer to see if she wanted it so badly. <laughs> Radiana also got up and asked him what was wrong or if there was something he didn't like. She said she would do whatever he asked. Radiana was worried about what would happen to Gino and Nika if she refused. Orazio didn't know how to explain his feelings either, so he started to say that he didn't understand what she was thinking. But the young beauty didn't let him finish his thought and quickly said that she understood, and he wanted Radiana to kiss him first. This thought knocked the ground out of his feet. He had not expected such a proposal, but it only turned him on. He came close to Radiana and said that she was a smart girl. Then he asked if Radiana would regret her decision. She looked him firmly in the eye and began to unravel her braid. Her golden hair fell over her shoulders, but Orazio decided to give in to her initiative and approach the beauty. Her lips stretched to meet his hot ones. In the palace of Emperor Solo, Her Highness, lying on the Emperor's chest, asked him in a gentle voice when Caligo could return. She alone knew how to influence the Emperor in his decisions. The cunning empress whispered that the constellations had long since changed since he left their palace, but Emperor Solo immediately became more serious. His mood changed dramatically, and he replied that he could still hear the cries of the innocent nymphs that Calgo had killed. The empress defended Calgo as best she could, 
and said that those nymphs were to blame for trying to get into his bed. But Solo was adamant and sharply replied that Caligo had killed a girl from the royal family. This was unforgivable, even to his own son. The empress saw that Solo's mood was already completely spoiled, so she whispered in a gentle voice that his highness was right, of course, and Caligo was guilty. But was he guilty of inheriting his father's beauty? The woman then went on to say that they must allow Caligo to return, for the Crescent Moon Festival would begin very soon. And how could Caligo not be there when even Orazio would be there? But Emperor Solo was adamant in his decision. He said that the balance of the heavens was upset by Caligo's sins, and it would take more than a thousand days for his anger to subside. The Empress realized that she was powerless today with her flattery and persuasion, so she thought about it a bit and decided that she would try to bring Caligo back at another time. But for today, she had to agree completely with Emperor Solo, so she bowed her head and said that if that was the Emperor's decision, she would wait obediently. The courtiers told the Emperor that the first Prince Saltus Lumen had arrived and wanted to see the Emperor. Solo ordered the Prince to be let into the hall immediately. When Saltus entered, he asked his father how he was feeling and kissed the Empress's hand. Saltus Lumen said that he welcomed Her Highness Avaricia Lumen and smiled at the woman. Her Highness was also pleased with this attention and said that she had heard about how the lands of Lanitia were becoming more beautiful day by day, all thanks to the incredible efforts of Saltus. The Emperor knew that Saltus did not come just to ask how he was doing, so he decided that the conversation would be really important. Solo turned to the Empress and said that she could be dismissed. The Empress wondered what secrets could be kept from her, but she could not disobey the Emperor's order, so she turned and walked out of the room. The Emperor was left alone with Saltus. When they sat down at the table, Solo asked him why he had come, because he never came unannounced. Saltus replied that he wanted to talk to him about Orazio. Emperor Solo's face immediately showed that he did not like this topic of conversation. The Emperor told Saltus that if he wanted to discuss the judge, he had nothing to say. But Saltus continued anyway, asking the Emperor why he did not stop the Empress when Orazio's mentor was on the execution list. For Orazio, it was quite a test to take the life of the man who had taught him everything and whom he trusted as much as himself. Emperor Solo replied that Saltus was a very kind young man, but kindness could not restore balance to the heavens, and the heavenly scales have already changed their position because of Orazio's power. And it was this decision that was made to restore balance to the heavenly scales. Saltus tried to reach out to his father and said that he was the only being whom Orazio trusted, and finally asked if Empress Avaricia had had a hand in it. Emperor Saul did not expect such a direct question and accusation at the same time, so he angrily said that he was Sol, and this truth would never change, even when the sun and moon disappeared. He also added that he would never in his life touch the heavenly scales for personal gain. Finally, he asked Saltus if he wanted the goddess of fate to end his life. Then Saltus said sharply that if Emperor Solo was telling the truth, he should let Caligo and Orazio fight. But Emperor Solo, after some thought, told Saltus that the time had not yet come for this battle. Saltus asked his father, if he wanted to give another chance to Caligo, who had killed innocent nymphs in a fit of passion, because it could also upset the balance if that happened. Emperor Solo didn't know what arguments to make in this regard, so he simply replied that Orazio was not suitable for the role of his heir. Then Saltus objected and said that if interpreted in this way, he had no right to be called the firstborn of the great Emperor Saul. He had his reasons for thinking so, and Saltus reminded the Emperor that almost no one knew the truth about him and his wife, and who better to understand his situation than Solo. But Emperor Solo explained to Saltus that his mother was a simple nymph, but she belonged to the family of the Almighty Zeus. Saltus was not like Orazio, because he was born to a mortal woman, but Saltus did not want to hear these annoying excuses, and sharply asked the Emperor when he had become such a coward. Saltus was already emotional, he did not want to hide his guesses, and he decided to speak frankly to the end so he told his father that Orazio's hands were covered in blood because of his orders. The emperor did not like the tone of his eldest son's conversation. To this day, he has not dared to say a word to his father in defiance. So Solo asked him how he dared to speak to him in such a tone. Solo began to make excuses, saying that Orazio was born a judge, and if he gave up his role, the balance of the heavens would be upset. But Saltus said that Orazio was still his son. But Emperor Solo added that in addition to being a son, he was also an uncontrollable deity. 
and if Orazio could not bear the burden that was placed on him, then his existence was a curse for everyone. The father no longer wanted to listen to his eldest son's accusations, even though they were all true. So he simply told Saltus not to mention Orazio's name in his presence. But Saltus added that they both knew perfectly well that if Orazio so desired, he could burn the celestial palace to the ground. The valet Gino looked out the window. He could not believe his eyes, so he asked aloud what was happening to the weather. Gino went to the window and looked outside. He stood and wondered what Orazio was doing right now, since the weather was so incredible. But when the valet realized, his eyes almost popped out of their sockets. He immediately thought of his highness and the young girl, and immediately ran to her room. No sooner had the valet appeared in the chamber and seen what was going on, than he shouted at the top of his lungs for Orazio to put Radiana down and not touch her. Orazio told Gino in a calm voice that he and Radiana were doing what a man and woman normally do, and it would be just fine if Radiana were immortal. But the valet said that Orazio should not approach Radiana until the day of the festival, especially not in any sexual way, and not only close relations, even holding hands, no kissing should be in their relationship with the young girl. Orazio could no longer contain his indignation, so he asked in displeasure why the valet should tell the prince what to do. The valet was boiling with anger. He shouted that he knew this would happen. He asked the prince why he hadn't touched anyone in two centuries and that it was too much even for such a late bloomer. But Orazio's patience was running out, so he blinked one eye and the valet's hair started to burn. Frightened, Gino shouted that he was unbearably hot. When the angry valet left the young girl's room, Orazio looked at the beauty with a tender gaze and took her golden hair in his hands. His highness sat down by the bed where his beauty fell asleep and whispered softly that they could gossip about anything, but he was sure that Radiana would be his forever. The next morning, Radiana slept longer than usual. When she opened her eyes, at first she thought she was having a nightmare, but when the young girl sat up in bed and tried to move her arms, she felt her whole body ache. Then she realized that it was real. She began to go over all the events of the previous night in her mind. The thought came to her that she was going to live forever. When Radiana began to look more closely at her body, she noticed that her skin was incredibly radiant. It looked as if it was covered in gold. Nifma came in just in time. She looked at her mistress and asked how she was feeling. Radiana was so quiet in the morning that Nika was thinking of calling her valet, Gino. The nymph asked Radiana how she was feeling. Radiana began to show the maid her skin and told her that something strange was happening to her, because her skin was shining as if she had been rolling in golden sand. The nymph smiled and said that Radiana was right. Before Nika could explain why, the nymph instantly disappeared, leaving only drops of water behind. Radiana noticed that her senses had been sharpened, because this time she could hear a sharp pop in the air. Radiana put all her guesses together and realized that Prince Orazio was somewhere very close to her. A smile appeared on the young beauty's face. Orazio opened the canopy over his beauty's bed and said that his spiritual energy was spreading throughout her body. And Radiana needs to drink more golden water so that she does not suffer from pain. Then Prince Orazio took hold of the edge of the bedspread and pulled it to reveal Radiana's body. But the girl grabbed the other edge of the bedspread and did not allow him to do so. His Highness felt Radiana holding the other edge of the bedspread tightly and asked the girl what she was doing. Radiana could think of nothing else to say but that she was feeling a bit chilly and would like to stay covered to keep warm. Orazio looked at the young girl and smiled. He was surprised at her cleverness and noticed how the skin on the beauty's face began to blush quickly. His Highness walked closer to the bed and whispered to Radiana to let him warm her up since she was so cold now. Before Radiana could answer, Orazio was at her side. Her body felt his presence, and a warm energy began to flow through it, making her heart beat faster. When his face was close to hers, Radiana blushed again. She was ashamed of the closeness, and at the same time did not want him to stop. She could feel his breath on her face. A moment later, his lips touched hers. Again, this warmth, these emotions, these sensations. She could no longer control herself. But before she could enjoy this kiss, they heard someone screaming nearby. They both turned their heads in alarm and noticed Gino, the valet, in the room. Gino began to shout that this was not right, that he had already explained to his highness that they were not to have contact with Radiana. But Orazio justified himself like a teenager, 
saying that it was just a simple kiss. Orazio leaned over the girl and whispered that her little lie was pathetic and didn't matter. His Highness also winked at his beauty and advised her that next time she should come up with a better reason, not to stay in her underwear in front of Orazio. But Gino's valet continued to babble that His Highness had already forgotten his warning that there should be no physical contact until the Crescent Festival. His Highness rolled his eyes and exhaled. He was beginning to get annoyed with his valet's overzealousness. But Gino had no intention of stopping. He turned to Radian and told her that she had to drink the golden water every day because its healing powers had their limits, and she needed this water to survive. Radiana decided to immediately follow the valet's instructions, and she drank the full cup of golden water to the bottom. When the bowl was empty, the young girl coughed and the valet explained that she had absorbed too much of His Highness's spiritual energy. Orazio approached the young girl and told her that she should drink the water regularly, because otherwise she would feel as if she were burning at the stake. Then Orazio snapped his right hand fingers, and a water blob appeared in the room. A moment later, a nymph stood in its place. His Highness ordered the maid to make sure that Lady Radiana drank the golden water every day until they left for the Celestial Palace. The nymph nodded her head obediently. Orazio then whispered in Radiana's ear that although it would not be easy, she must drink the golden water one glass a day. The young girl obediently followed all the instructions, and every day, under the close supervision of her maid, she drank a glass of golden water. When Radiana once again put an empty cup on the table, Nika said that it was a good job, but Radiana smiled and replied that she hadn't done anything significant. Then Radiana looked at her maid and thought that it must be very difficult for Nika to have a mistress like that, so she decided to make some beautiful jewelry for the nymph as a token of her gratitude. Radiana sat down at her desk and took out the tools they needed. She thought about what kind of jewelry she would make for Nikki and decided that it would be a beautiful hairpin. But before she could even touch the tools, the shadowy maids appeared and stood over Radiana. Radiana was even frightened by the surprise. Drops of sweat appeared on her forehead, and she asked the maids in confusion what exactly brought them here. The shadowy maids explained that His Highness had ordered them to take away all the items that could harm Radiana. That is why they came here right now. Then the shadowy maids did not hesitate to take away all Radiana's tools and silver jewelry. After they left, the nymph said that it was a shame that the maids had taken everything. The girls were especially sorry that they had taken Magus's gift. But Radiana decided to support the nymph somehow, and said that everything was fine and there was nothing wrong with it. But the nymph felt so sorry for the jewelry that tears rolled down her cheeks. Radiana gently wiped away Nikki's tears and assured her that she had no reason to cry. Late at night, the nymph Nika walked along the dark street, thinking about one question. Why did Gino's valet call her at such a late hour? But the young maid's attention was drawn to a strange glow. When Nika came closer, she noticed a piece of jewelry lying on the ground that had recently been taken away by the shadowy maids. Nika immediately heard the voice of the valet, asking how long she would be staring at the jewelry. He explained that he had enchanted it so that no one could see it, not even His Highness. As the nymph hesitated, the valet asked if she wanted Lady Radiana to be sad again. After that, the nymph grabbed the jewelry and quickly ran to her mistress. The valet, Gino, watched the nymph run quickly to the palace and wondered aloud why nymphs were so slow-witted. He heard a voice nearby saying that he didn't know the answer to this question either. Frightened, Gino turned his head and saw Orazio standing next to him. His Highness looked angrily at the valet and said that as a punishment he would not allow him to be near him at the festival. When the nymph ran to Lady Radiana and showed her what she had found, the girl's joy knew no bounds. They forgot when they had ever been so happy. Orazio also saw the happiness on the girls' faces and scolded himself for his valet's ability to think of it before his highness. At night, Lady Radiana woke up feeling dozens of dark hands touching her. The frightened young girl covered herself with a blanket and did not know what they all wanted from her. The nymph quickly came to the aid of her mistress. She shouted to the shadow maids that they should not frighten Lady Radiana and that they should stop doing this. The shadow maids stopped and looked at the nymph. They did not expect such a response and did not know what to do because they had received clear instructions from His Highness the day before. But when the shock wore off, the maids explained to the nymph that the Crescent Moon Festival was coming up and that Lady Radiana had to prepare herself for the visit to the Heavenly Palace. 
but the nymph told the maids that she was the boss and they should remember that. Radiana also stood up for Nika and assured her that she would immediately start preparing for her duties. But the shadow maids all said that Lady Radiana should hurry up, because there was very little time left, and they did not want to be burned by His Highness if they failed. Although the shadowy maids had left Radiana's room, the young girl could feel their presence and noticed the maids watching her closely from behind the windows and walls. The nymph called Radiana to her. She told her that after bathing, she would smear the young girl with aromatic oils. Since she was going as the prince's companion, she had to look the part. The nymph explained that they had to convince everyone at the festival that Radiana was a nymph, and then His Highness would get married. Then Nika took out some green leaves with something wrapped in them. The joyful nymph said that she had managed to bring something for Radiana and opened her cache of precious jewelry. The irritated valet was already getting quite nervous. He had been getting ready for a long time and was ranting about how long it would take them to get ready and that they would be late because of their jewelry and where it was. Then the valet asked His Highness if he had really decided to go with them. But Orazio was somewhere else entirely. He was completely in his own thoughts. Orazio was very concerned about whether everyone would believe that Radiana was a nymph and how she would be received at the festival. His Highness analyzed the appearance of his beauty and thought that in all of Povium there was no such weak and gentle nymph. Orazio also decided that he should prepare himself in case his father rejected Radiana. He wondered if he should intervene if Solo decided to strike the girl with lightning. But his thought was interrupted by a loud message from a servant that Lady Radiana had arrived. This message brought the prince back to reality. Gino nervously muttered that they had finally arrived. The doors to the hall opened and Radiana walked in. She was simply incredibly beautiful. Her hair was beautifully styled, and her jewelry sparkled with colorful shades on her body. Gino's valet had never seen such a beautiful girl in all his years, so he even opened his mouth in surprise. Orazio also did not expect Radiana to be so beautiful, although he expected that after the nymph's spells on her appearance, she would be very beautiful. Radiana was gorgeous. Orazio stared at his beauty in silence for several minutes and could not say a word. Then he said quietly that she had allowed him to examine her. His gaze went all over the girl, and only then did he say that she looked very much like a nymph. Radiana was embarrassed, and again a red blush appeared on her cheeks. When the young people went outside, Radiana saw that a real ship was waiting for them at the door. This naturally surprised the young girl, but she was even more surprised when she saw a leopard on the ship. At first she thought it was a very well-made statue. Orazio noticed that Radiana was interested in his animal and explained to the young girl that it was his first black leopard, which had lived only a century. Then His Highness added that Radiana would be able to live much longer since she could absorb his spiritual energy. The girl only listened attentively to His Highness in silence. Orazio looked into her eyes and asked her to say something, because he had the impression that he was talking to a statue. The prince hugged his beauty to make her relax a little. Radiana looked into Orazio's eyes and said that it was all very beautiful, she meant the statue. Orazio noticed that the girl was confused and decided to give her some guidance to help her gather her thoughts and get ready to meet his family. He took her by the chin and looked into her eyes. Or as he told Radiana that she should not show her fear in Povius. He asked that the young girl remember what she was like when they first met. He added that his beauty should show the whole world that she was a worthy chosen one of the sun prince Orazio Lumen. The confused girl just blinked her eyes and could not answer. Orazio also added that he would not tolerate such an attitude when they left the ship and that she should play the role of his companion in Povium so she could start right now. Radiana was confused and decided to consult her maid. She found the nymph on the ship and said that they needed to talk urgently. Nika gladly agreed to Radiana's suggestion. When the girls were alone, Radiana took the nymph by the hand and asked her the question she was most interested in. She asked if Nika had ever been in love in her life. Nika's eyes even lit up at this question. She said that of course she had. Love is like breathing for a nymph, and at the thought of love, her heart speeds up its rhythm. Then Radiana asked the nymph how to look at someone when you are in love. Nika thought about it. She had never even noticed how to look. It was an asterisk question. But after some thought, the nymph came up with an answer. She said she needed to remember the best thing Radiana had ever seen in her life. The nymph began to sketch out options for what Radiana should remember in her head, and these were the following suggestions. Something beautiful, 
something wonderful, something incredible. Radiana began to go through all the beautiful things she had seen in her life, and the only thing that came to mind was Orazio. His powerful body, his beautiful hair, his facial features. Radiana was frightened by her thoughts. She blushed at her fantasies, held her head, and thought it couldn't be. It looked like Radiana was going crazy. Radiana realized that the most beautiful, incredible, wonderful, and beautiful thing she had ever seen in her life was Orazio. This began to remind her of the story of foolish mortals who fell in love with deities, and Radiana could not believe that she had become one of them. Radiana was brought back to reality by the voice of His Highness. He said that the girl had enough time to practice because she was already keeping God waiting. Radiana, confused, could only say that, of course she was. She hadn't expected him to find her so quickly to show her what she had learned. Orazio gently hugged the young girl and was surprised to hear her say that she had already practiced. So he asked Radiana to demonstrate what she had learned. But Radiana was confused and did not know how to demonstrate it. There was only one question in her mind. What should she do now? Drops of cold sweat broke out on her back from excitement. She clearly decided that she needed to look up and look him in the eye, and look so that everyone would believe that she was head over heels in love with him, and that there was no turning back for her. But Orazio looked her in the eyes and told her that she disappointed him and asked her to look at him again. But even after that, her gaze did not change, so Orazio just looked at the beautiful woman in disappointment. Radiana realized that at this rate, she would not only expose herself at the festival, but would not even get off the ship. So she began to go through all the possible options in her head. The idea came to her that she should think of Orazio not as a god, but as a mere mortal. Radiana decided to imagine him as a man who had just been disappointed in his beloved. Radiana summoned all her imagination and decided to try to look at Orazio with loving eyes again. She took the plunge and called out to His Highness. Orazio turned and looked at the young girl. She looked directly into the young man's eyes. Her gaze was tender and full of feelings. He was speechless for a moment. The ship sailed nonstop for a day and a half. Radiana spent a lot of time on deck and constantly admired the scenery. She had never seen such incredible beauty in her life. The valet came up to her and told her that they would be arriving soon. Povius and Tesca are located at opposite ends of the heavens, which is why the journey takes so long. Gino warned Radiana to remain vigilant at all times. Because Povius is very different from Tesca. One mistake and the locals would eat the young girl alive. Radian's eyes widened in surprise. She certainly hadn't expected such serious instructions, so she decided that she needed to be very careful and take Gino's advice. The valet advised Radiana to play the role of Prince Orazio's companion, the only way she would survive the journey. He advised Radiana to memorize his words well. The valet also gave Radiana some more advice and told her to stay close to Orazio if she wanted to survive in the terrarium where they were going. Finally, after such a long journey, the ship began to see the shore. It was the majestic Povius, home to the most influential deities of the Celestial Empire. Orazio spent almost the entire journey alone, and the image of Radiana, who was practicing looking at him with a loving gaze, was constantly before his eyes. He constantly wondered if she felt something for him, or if it was just a pretense. He worried that Radiana might not be interested in him. His Highness was deep in thought when he heard someone calling him. He would have recognized that voice out of a thousand, so before he could turn around, he knew his beauty would be standing there. When their eyes met, he simply dissolved into her gaze. She didn't boldly ask him if he deserved praise. He could not say a word for several minutes, just admiring the beauty. Orazio looked at the young girl and could not stop admiring her beauty. Then he overcame himself and said that she was quite convincing. Radiana was happy that she had managed to please the prince. Then Orazio put his hand gently on Radiana's head and said that he wished her good luck at the festival. Their attention was distracted by loud cheering. Radiana looked to the shore. A whole crowd of people had gathered on the shore, waiting for the ship to arrive. They were all shouting loudly to welcome the great judge of Povius, Prince Orazio Lumen. Radiana watched them from the ship and thought that Orazio must be respected and admired here, since so many people came out to meet him. His Highness stood proudly on the ship and basked in the joyful shouts of the crowd. He was pleased that people were so supportive of his arrival at the Crescent Festival. 
Orazio then turned to the young girl and said that they would see each other later. His Highness headed for the exit. The confused Radiana was left alone in this unknown place. Disgruntled, Tara threw her jewelry so that the mirror cracked. She shouted to the maids to bring more beautiful jewelry because she had to impress Prince Orazio. The Empress slowly entered the room. She asked her niece what all the fuss was about. Tara turned and greeted her highness in a low bow. They both looked into the broken mirror. The Empress said that Tara had access to Povius's finest jewelry, so what was the matter? Tara explained that Prince Orazio had brought a nymph with him to the festival. Nervous, Tara began to complain to the Empress that this was not enough. Perhaps the jewelry created by the famous Mr. Magus would have saved the day. The Empress smiled and asked if Tara was worried about losing to some ugly nymph because of a couple of pieces of jewelry. She shouldn't take such trifles into her head. The Empress loudly ordered her maids to see to it that Tara was dressed nicely, and the sooner the better. Her Highness picked up the jewelry that Tara had thrown a few minutes ago and told the girl to stop throwing tantrums immediately because her patience had already broken. The Empress then walked up behind Tara, put her arms around her waist, and told her that she needed to keep her child in mind before she started to get nervous. Tara just stood there numb. Drops of cold sweat appeared on her forehead. She quickly began to make excuses and told Her Highness that she had no idea what child the Empress was talking about. The angry Empress slapped Terry so hard that the poor girl fell to the floor. Her Highness shouted that how dare she lie to the Empress. The Empress yelled at the girl, who could not yet recover from the blow. Her Highness asked whether Tara wanted her child to die before birth or to be raised as a sunny prince. Finally, the Empress told the girl that this was her last warning, and Tara must do everything to deceive the fate of the heavens. And perhaps if she conquers Orazio, she will save her child. A broken Tara sat on the floor. She simply boiled over with anger and injustice. Her only goal at that time was to do anything to have Orazio hers. In the main hall of the palace of His Highness Sol Lumen, it was loudly announced that Prince Orazio of Tesca had already arrived at the palace. A whisper spread through the hall that she would finally see Orazio with her own eyes. Prince Orazio appeared in the hall, well-dressed and handsome. The women began to whisper that at last the prince had a companion, and everyone wanted to see the one chosen by Orazio himself. There was also a whisper in the crowd that it was necessary to take the green pills, and some people started taking them immediately and Orazio also noticed the courtiers taking Rhinum. Prince Orazio thought to himself that they were all fools and did not even realize that the Rhinum did not actually work, although the voices in the prince's head became quieter after taking the pill. Prince Orazio walked confidently to the throne of Solo Lumen. On his right hand was the unsurpassed Empress. On his left was his first son, Saltus Lumen. Prince Orazio was the first to greet the honored hosts of the palace and asked Solo Lumen if he was feeling well. Solo Lumen looked at his son and said that he thought Orazio of Tesca was perfectly fine. He had certainly expected to see his son in worse condition after his conversation with Salthus. Orazio smiled in response and said that he had no reason to complain, because after two centuries he was finally able to get intimate with a young nymph. At the same time, after he said that, all the women began to whisper and discuss this news, Although gossip about his relationship had been circulating for a long time, the Empress smiled and said that this was very good news, so she was happy to hear and congratulated Orazio. Orazio also told Her Highness that she was absolutely right that this was very good news. Then, after these standard exchanges of pleasantries, Orazio walked to the throne and took his place of honor next to his older brother, Saltus Lumen. The Empress turned to Saltus and asked him how his wife Vicaria was doing. Saltus told everyone present, that he had been told recently that his wife was in labor. The Empress was overjoyed and told her husband that His Highness would soon have his first grandchild. Then the Empress turned to Orazio and asked him when he would introduce them to his companion, because they were already at a loss to guess who could have won Orazio's favor. Orazio calmly assured everyone that his companion would soon arrive at the palace. The Empress said that this was all very well, but first she wanted to introduce him to Terra the daughter of Vamus of the House of Piros, who was to become his bride. Everyone was sure that Orazio would like Terra. The girl bowed and said that Terraconium was at his service. Terra tried to be as polite and friendly as possible. Orazio looked at Terra, who was going out of her way to please Prince Orazio Lumen. But then, Orazio turned his head in a straight line and didn't pay attention to Terra at all. She was shocked, 
because she thought she would win His Highness's heart and attention at first sight. Then Oraki abruptly stood up from his throne. Even his elder brother was startled by this action, and he asked Orazio what he was going to do now. But the calm Orazio said that he apologized for the inconvenience, but his beloved companion had arrived, so he had to meet her. The whole hall was loudly informed that the guests had arrived. The first to enter the central hall of the palace was Gino, the valet. He greeted the guests and smiled at Orazio. Then, an incredibly beautiful and beautifully dressed young girl entered the hall. Her golden hair was adorned with precious stones and a very beautiful silver jewelry. Orazio immediately went over to Radiana and gently put his arms around her waist. He wanted her to relax and not to worry under the stares of the guests. Radiana was grateful for Orazio's support and looked at him with a tender gaze. Orazio whispered softly in her ear that it was time for her to be enchanted. The prince covered her eyes with his warm hand. Orazio stood behind his companion and asked permission from Sol Lumen, the son of the sun and his venerable father, to introduce Radiana, his first love. Sol Lumen looked at the young girl and his son and said he could let go of his hand. When Orazio let go of his hand, Radiana's eyes met the emperor's intense gaze. She immediately lowered her head and said that the nymph Radiana, a descendant of Circe, was ready to serve him. This announcement sparked a new discussion. All the women of the court began to whisper that this girl was a descendant of the weak stone goddess Circe. Saltus was pleasantly surprised by the manners and beauty of Orazio's chosen one and said that they were happy to welcome the nymph to this crescent festival. Solo Lumen loudly told Radiana that if she claimed to be a descendant of Circe, could she show something to prove her words? Radiana was not at a loss and answered the emperor that she could create jewelry from silver threads. The empress immediately noticed the silver lily in Radiana's head, created by Mr. Magus. The empress hoped that Radiana might be embarrassed here, so she invited the nymph to demonstrate her jewelry-making skills right there. Immediately, the tools necessary for the work and even a stove appeared in the hall. So there was no turning back. The valet's heart began to race. Solo Lumen said that Radiana could start. The girl was not even nervous. As soon as she saw the familiar tools, she immediately got to work. The frail young girl picked up a hammer and tongs and skillfully began to make the jewelry. It was such a fascinating and extraordinary sight that everyone present opened their mouths. The nymphs began to whisper that they had never seen a nymph working with silver using the heat of a furnace. They also discussed what else she could have learned in Magus's cave. A few minutes later, a beautiful silver jewelry was twisted in Radiant's skillful hands, and she took it in her hands and asked Saul Lumen's permission to give him this silver rose. Saul Lumen took the gift and was sincerely surprised by such an exquisite work. He loudly said that he recognized Radiana, the descendant of the Circeans, as Orazio's beloved. Solo then turned to Orazio and said that his son had proven his worth, so he insisted on Orazio and Terra's wedding as soon as possible. Orazio quietly said that if it was the will of the gods. The empress smiled evilly. She will finally get what she wants and marry Terra and Orazio soon. Solo Lumen announced to the whole palace that let the sunshine shine on this quiet night for the mighty descendants of the sun god. Orazio clung to Radiana and did not leave her for a moment. Solo continued, announcing the start of the festival. He said that everyone was having fun until the first rays of sunshine appeared in the sky. And the festival began. All the guests present began to celebrate. The best wines were offered in a wide range. Men and women were chatting merrily over a glass of alcohol. Radiana was not in the mood for alcoholic beverages. She kept her eyes fixed on the thrones on which all the most important gods of the heavenly kingdom were seated. They were looking down on their subordinates. Of course, she was particularly interested in only one of the gods, and that was Orazio Lumen. She kept looking at him and wanted to meet his eyes to feel his support. Orazio also watched his beauty and noticed how the young girl's gaze changed to warm and full of feelings, although he had doubts about the sincerity of her look. This peaceful idyll was broken by someone's voice. Radiana turned around and noticed that a beautifully dressed young girl, accompanied by her maids, was purposefully approaching her in the hall. Finally, the young girl came closer to Radiana, and she was able to get a better look at her. She could tell from her expensive clothes and jewelry that she belonged to a wealthy family. As soon as the young woman approached Radiana, she insultingly asked the sneering woman if she was the stone nymph wearing the silver lily created by Mr. Magus. 
She then asked Radian if Mr. Magus had really taught the nymph how to work with silver threads. Radiana looked at the young woman with surprised eyes, who was so interested in her person, and confirmed that this was the case. Then the young girl decided to introduce herself and said that her name was Terraconium, and she came from the famous Pyros family. She was also engaged to Prince Orazio, the son of the sun god. This introduction simply knocked the ground from under Radiana's feet. She was at a loss as to whether she should say that she was glad to meet him or express her hope for another meeting. Radiana decided she had to make sure Prince Orazio got married. But Tara waved her hand and told her not to try to be too well-mannered. One of the maids whispered in her mistress's ear that she had heard that centaurs were very fond of beautiful young girls, and they started giggling together. Then Tara turned to Radiana and said with a smile on her face, for all to hear, that Radiana must have used seduction to convince Mr. Magus to help her. The confused Radiana blushed with shame. She could not have imagined that such nonsense could occur to anyone. The young girl only said quietly that she had no idea what she was talking about. But Tara just continued her guesses that how else could an unknown nymph become the first lady of Prince Orazio, and added that Radiana could tell the truth about what she was like in bed. The valet heard all this conversation and came to the aid of the confused girl. He told her that Tara was being ridiculous, because Magus and Radiana's relationship was not what she was implying. Tara turned blue with indignation. She angrily asked how the insignificant elf dared to say anything to her, let alone call her funny. Tara immediately used her magic power, and the valet began to choke. It became increasingly difficult for him to breathe, and he fell to the floor. Only then did Tara stop and stop her torture. Frightened, Radiana ran up to the valet and asked if he was okay. The girl was very scared for him and tried to bring Gino to his senses. Angry, Radiana turned to Tara and angrily asked her what she was doing and why she was treating the valet like that, since he hadn't said anything wrong. But Tara just laughed and told her not to tell Radiana that she was on the side of that stupid elf. She also added that Radiana was just her replacement in Prince Orazio's bed. Tara reminded Radiana that she didn't belong here and that she shouldn't forget where she really belonged. Finally, Tara wanted to ask the girl what it was like to be in bed with Orazio. Radiana was already on edge. Orazio's stubborn fiancé had driven her crazy with her antics and barbed remarks. She stood up and proudly looked this person in the eye. Radiana asked that Tara probably wanted to hear the details of their first night, so she had something to say. Radiana said that at first she felt incredibly hot, then she began to melt in Prince Orazio's arms, and the young girl obediently fulfilled all the requests of the hot prince. When Radiana finished her story, she even remembered the incredible sensations that covered her whole body, so she asked in the end if Terry had enough details. After that, the room fell into an oppressive silence. All eyes were on the two young girls who stood opposite each other and were figuring out their relationship. The girls were also silent. Radiana wondered if she had done the right thing in telling them about it, because she did not want to share such intimate details of her and Orazio's relationship. Moreover, she was glad that Prince Orazio was getting married soon. It was for this reason that she had to try. Then, Radiana could live in peace and create silver jewelry. But before Radiana could think about her words and dreams for the future, she felt a hot and hard slap on her cheek. The young girl was not expecting this at all. Radiana fell to the floor from such a strong blow. The precious jewelry from her hair scattered all over the hall. Tara haughtily stood over Radiana and looked at the girl triumphantly. The nymph saw her mistress fall and rushed to her aid. She felt sorry for Radiana, and if she could, she would have torn the bastard who dared to lay a hand on the girl right there. Radiana touched her cheek, which hurt so much that it throbbed even in her head. Her first thought was that she had failed to live up to the expectations of her Orazio, who had asked her to try. The nymph ran to Radiana in a second. She helped the girl up and asked how she was feeling. They both knew that this should not have happened in any case. Furious, Tara shouted that Radiana was a brazen bitch. How dare she insult a member of the Pyros family, because this miserable nymph was just lucky enough to become a prince's bedfellow. At the same moment, Orazio appeared next to the girls. He was not happy with what was happening here. He loudly asked what kind of showdown was going on in the middle of the hall. Orazio turned to Radiana and asked the confused girl to explain what had happened. Tara was mentally celebrating her victory. She had achieved what she wanted. 
she thought that none of the princes would want to deal with the nymph she had used. Tara decided to be the first to tell the story of the dispute, just as she wanted. So she said that she didn't have to respond to the nymph's insults, so he shouldn't interfere in this ridiculous dispute. Then Orazio looked at Radiana and asked if it was really her fault, and everything Tara had just said was true. The confused Radiana only whispered that it was not true. She did not know what to do in this situation. Should she tell the whole truth or just keep quiet? Orazio approached his beauty and gently touched her red cheek. He said that he did not like it when something that belonged to him was damaged. So he asked Radiana if she wanted to hit Tara in return, or if he should just cut off the hands of this offender. Tara almost fainted from what she heard. Radiana held her hand to her red cheek and thought about what she should say to Orazio. Without hesitation, he repeated his question again and waited for the decision that his beauty would make. Suddenly, the Empress herself appeared in the epicenter of the events. From her seat, she noticed that something was wrong and came to the aid of her niece. She looked sternly at the girls. Her Highness tried to soften the situation and somehow influence Orazio so that he would not harm her favorite. She said in a soft tone that the prince must be joking, because all women are jealous. The Empress added that women lose their heads when it comes to men. So don't make it so complicated, because Tara just had a little quarrel with his nymph. The Empress added that it was a tradition, but no lady likes to have something that belongs to her taken away from her. Orazio looked at the Empress and asked her in what sense he belonged to Terry. Orazio said in a firm tone of voice, so that not only Her Highness Avaricia could hear, that he did not belong to anyone in this world, so such statements were not appropriate. At that time, for a moment, Avaricia felt that she was drowning in the darkness of Orazio's eyes. She felt sick. She almost coughed up the rhinum pill she had taken shortly before the festival. The Empress decided to smooth things over and explained to Orazio that his father had announced that he and Tara were engaged, and that was why it was his duty to marry the girl. But Orazio just asked what the hell his duty was. His mood was completely spoiled, so no one knew how to calm down the angry Orazio. His older brother Saltus decided to come to the rescue. He also came down to the hall and said that Orazio had never been angry about such trifles before. With a single movement of his hand, Saltus immediately healed the wound from the slap on Radiana's face, and her skin became snow-white again, as if no one had touched it. Saltus asked them not to make a fuss about this minor misunderstanding, and to return to their seats, because they had to continue celebrating the Crescent Moon Festival. But Orazio explained in a calm voice that his beloved had not yet answered the question, so he believed that the incident was not yet over. He will wait for Radiana's answer. The Empress was already irritated, and said that she knew the nymph had taken over his body, but she had no idea that it also affected his heart. She added that Orazio had spent too much time in Tesco. Her Highness asked how he could have offended the wills of Povius, and how could he even think of cutting off the goddess's hand because of a blow from a nymph? Or did he imagine himself to be the judge of all the gods? But Orazio did not seem to pay attention to all the Empress's arguments. He once again asked Radiana to give an answer before he cut off Terry's hand and brought it to his beloved. The Empress realized that Orazio would not calm down, so she put on a cheerful face and asked that the nymph should still say her answer to everyone present, if the prince insisted. Confused, Radiana looked at the Empress carefully. She could see that Avaricha looked cheerful and happy, but she had seen such a predatory look before in her life. Radiana realized that such a woman would stop at nothing to achieve what she wanted. She would not blink an eye and would give up other people's lives for it. She was very much like Grazia. Radiana realized that she needed to get out of this situation as soon as possible, because she had already gone so far that no one would be able to forget about her. So, Radiana decided to somehow influence her prince's mood. She hoped that he would listen to her words and they would be able to solve such a difficult problem. She looked at Orazio and said that she thought that it was not worth depriving His Highness of the hand of the goddess Terra. After all, nothing matters when Prince Orazio is by her side. Radina also explained that this dispute was her fault because she dared to share the details of their first night. And of course, no woman could listen to that calmly. Then Radiana came closer to Orazio and gently took his hand. She said quietly that if he wanted to punish anyone, it should be Radiana herself. Then, Radiana became embarrassed and added that she didn't want him to punish her right there. It would be better to do it in private. 
so she asked Orazio to forget about this stupid argument. All those present had long since surrounded the perpetrators of such an incident and were hanging on every word the god said. When Radiana finished her speech, everyone was even a little sad that she would not be punished today. Radiana looked into Orazio's eyes and asked him to discuss all the details in private. He drowned in the eyes of his beloved and forgot what he wanted to do. Of course, Orazio could not resist his beloved's request and said that he would certainly do as she wished. The empress even opened her mouth in surprise. She certainly thought that this nymph would use this opportunity to cut off the hand of the offender. Orazio tenderly took Radiana in his arms and told the empress that his beloved was not interested in revenge, so they would postpone all disputes for later because he had more important things to do. A moment later, Orazio and Radiana disappeared from the hall. The empress was still reeling from the scandal and stood in the middle of the room, spellbound. She had not expected Orazio to have such feelings for the nymph. In the world of mortals, in a room next to the arena, Grace Mundos was receiving the advances of men who were trying to woo the fastidious young girl. Suddenly, the door of the room opened, and a tall young man entered, shouting loudly that he had not seen Grace for many years. Grace got out of bed and shouted at him to watch his foolish tongue, because Grace was not her name now. The man was Grace's half-brother, Alexis Mundos. With a smile on his face, Alexis Mundos asked if the audience knew the young girl's real name. Grazia decided to get straight to the point. She was sure that her brother had not come here just to say hello. She asked him directly if he had run out of money. Alexis Mundos began to tell her that he had heard from people that Grazia was making very good money in the arena. The angry Gracie sternly told him that he knew perfectly well that she spent almost all her money on supporting the gladiators, and that she had no money at the moment. But Alexis just laid down on her bed and said that they were different. She was good at earning money, and he was good at spending it. He also always believed in her success in this business. Alexis Mondos also added that she was good at pretending to be a priestess, secretly supporting gladiatorial fights, and on top of that, managing to warm a noble man's bed. She looked at him in a way that made her ready to kill him immediately, but he just told her not to look at him with that look, because he would keep her secret that she had sacrificed herself at the ceremony. When Radiana and Orazio found themselves alone in the beautiful garden, the young girl could not stop admiring the scenery. Everything was fabulously beautiful, both the plants and the exotic animals. She asked His Highness to put her on her feet so that she could see the beauty better. It was also a starry night outside, so the scenery looked even more magical. When Orazio fulfilled her wish and the young girl stood in front of him, he looked passionately into her eyes and asked her if she was ready to receive the punishment she had asked for a few minutes ago. Radiana felt cold inside. She looked at the prince and asked him what kind of punishment she was going to receive. He explained that he would punish her like an adult and hoped that she would not lose consciousness. The valet could not stop. He poured himself a glass after another and immediately emptied it to the bottom. Gino could barely stand up, but he was not going to stop. The nymph began to worry about the valet, so she told him that if he didn't stop, he would drink himself into unconsciousness. And that's all they need to get into trouble. Nika dared to approach the valet and snatched the wine glass from his hands. He shouted irritatedly, asking why she allowed herself to look down on him and do such a disgrace. The nymph was constantly thinking for her mistress. She said thoughtfully that she hoped Radiana was okay, because when the crescent moon was over them, His Highness would definitely do so. The valet was already drunk and told her to shut up. He shouted that Prince Orazio could not forget his duty. Then the valet was silent for a moment and began to listen to his own feelings. He immediately realized that something was wrong. The valet shouted to the whole room to be quiet and called for the nymph. Gino said that they urgently needed to find Radiana and Orazio. A few minutes later, the excited nymph stood next to the valet in front of the gate to the palace. Gino shouted loudly to the guards to open the door immediately. As soon as the door opened, the valet flew inside. He was quickly followed by a nymph. When they entered the hall, they saw Radiana lying unconscious on the floor in the middle of it. Orazio was sitting over the young girl. He was looking at his beauty in confusion. Irritated, Gino immediately began to save Radiana. He tried to bring her back to consciousness. Gino kept telling her that the prince had to learn to control himself, otherwise he would kill Radiana. But Orazio himself did not expect that the young girl would not stand it. 
He explained that he was simply fulfilling her wishes, exactly what she had asked for. The Prince of the Sun looked at the valet in confusion. The valet tried his best to bring Radiana back to life. But after several attempts, he said doomedly that his healing powers did not work this time. Orazio looked at the valet, then at his beauty, who had been unconscious for a long time. The prince called the nymph to him and ordered her to call Prince Saltus. In another room of the palace, Tara was sobbing bitterly. She sat on the floor and watched her tears fall down in a hail of tears. Suddenly, the door to the room opened with a powerful force. The empress appeared in the doorway, and she was humorless. She shouted to the whole room, Tara! Then, her highness quickly walked over to the crying girl and slapped her as hard as she could. The empress was seriously angry. She was ready to kill Tara. Tara clutched her cheek and cried even more. She was already in a bad place, and now Aunt Avaricha added fuel to the fire. The empress shouted that Tara was a stupid girl, because after she had put on a whole bunch of precious jewelry, Tara could not defeat the worthless nymph. Tara sobbed bitterly. Her tears had already formed a puddle on the floor of the hall. The empress shouted irritably that she had to stop crying and correct her mistake immediately. But Tara still had a bit of dignity left. So she said that she was a goddess from a noble family, and she could not cower before a worthless nymph. But the empress angrily shouted that she had lost the crown in this battle. Therefore, the empress could get rid of Tara's entire family in one fell swoop, and it was not worth disappointing her highness. Avaricia said that she had turned a blind eye to Tara's relationship with another man, and did not understand how the stupid girl dared to go to the doctor to find out the condition of that unborn scum. Through her tears, Tara explained that she had unbearable pains in her lower abdomen and was afraid that she might lose the baby, so she went to the doctor for help. But the furious empress was not ready to hear such excuses, so she kicked Tara even harder. She shouted that it would be better if the bastard had died than to have so much trouble now. The empress shouted that the young girl was still alive only because she could be of use to the empress. She walked even closer to Tara and angrily said that she had better fulfill her highness's request or she would lose her head otherwise, so it was time to pay the bills. Avaricia folded her arms at her sides and ordered Terry to get up immediately. She could eradicate Tara's entire family in an instant, so if she wanted to live, she had to marry Orazio. Tara did not know what to do. Finally, the empress shouted that Tara could kiss the nymph's feet, but whether the Pyro's family would continue to exist or be lost forever would depend on her. Radiana finally opened her eyes. Her head was all jumbled, and she couldn't understand what had happened and where she was for a long time. So she looked around carefully. When she noticed the young man next to her, she immediately remembered that she had seen him at the Crescent Festival. It was Orazio's brother, Saltus. He also looked at the girl and asked if she was okay. Saltus was not in a good mood, so he did not want to have a long conversation with Radiana. He said she didn't have to thank him for saving her. He quickly turned around and walked to the exit. Finally, he told the confused girl that she was mortal, so she should stay away from Prince Orazio's bed as much as possible if she wanted to stay alive. The nymph immediately ran to Radiana and asked how her mistress was feeling. Nika began to tell her that she was very afraid for Radiana. She could not even imagine that Prince Orazio could do this to her right in the imperial palace. But that was the last thing on Radiana's mind at the moment. She was confused and frightened by the halibut prince's words. Now she had a more general question. Radiana looked into the eyes of her maid and asked in confusion what she should do now that Prince Saltus had learned that she was mortal. Orazio was sitting alone in his room. His thoughts were somewhere far away. He was with his beloved. In recent days, he could not get Radiana out of his mind. His loneliness was broken by his older brother. Saltus, who had just brought Radiana back to life, came into the room and asked his brother why he had deceived the sun god Saul. Orazio calmly explained that he had not deceived anyone. Then Saltus asked if her highness knew that Radiana was mortal. Orazio turned his head toward his brother and asked if it mattered now. And why ask so many questions at all? Saltus was losing patience, so he said that the human girl should be dead. And why did Orazio save her at all, if only to satisfy his passion? But Orazio explained that she had been sacrificed by humans. And now Radiana is his only and first woman, so he advised them to stop arguing about this issue. Saltus still insisted on his point. 
he firmly told Orazio that he had to get rid of the human woman, and the sooner the better. Orazio persisted, so he told Saltus that he must have noticed that Radiana had his energy in her veins, so she was also immortal. Saltus said that this was his last warning, and that he should remember that he was the Sun Prince, the judge of the heavens and a divine being. But Orazio said he didn't want any of that, but Saltus said that this was his destiny. Orazio replied that if Saltus did not want Povius to fall into Caligo's hands, then he should not interfere in Orazio's affairs. Prince Orazio also added that if something did not go Orazio's way, he would burn everything to the ground in heaven. Orazio's words made the big brother break out in a cold sweat. He asked him if he really wanted to fight their own father, Saul, but Orazio calmly looked out the window and said only that when it happened, he would spare Lenidus if Saltus so desired. Saltus loudly replied that he was tired of Orazio's pride and arrogance, so he had to take responsibility for his people. After these words, Orazio laughed out loud and asked which people his older brother was referring to. Then, Orazio opened the curtain that separated them from the central hall and calmly told Saltus that they should go, because the festival had just started. As every year, the festival was opened with an incredible fireworks display. Hundreds of bright lights lit up the sky. None of the attendees wanted to miss this breathtaking spectacle. Radiana couldn't take her eyes off such beauty either. She tried to memorize every moment, because she had never been present among the gods at a celebration before in her life. Radiana was admiring the fireworks, but in her mind she was with her Orazio. She was brought back to reality by the loud voice of her maid calling out to her. When Radiana turned her head, she saw Nika carrying a huge glass of some kind of drink. As soon as the nymph drew it closer, she explained to Radiana that it was nectar, the drink of the gods. Radiana looked at the red-colored drink and asked what it was called. She had never even heard of it. Radiana looked into the cup and told her maid that perhaps she should not drink it. The nymph only replied sadly that Lady Radiana should not behave like that. The upset nymph explained that they had a tradition that if the mistress did not take the first sip, she would not have the right to taste the drink of the gods, and she wanted to. The nymph offered to give Radiana just one glass. The young girl timidly took a sip of the strange drink. The tart, sweet taste of the drink pampered Radiana's taste buds. The nymph could hardly wait for Radiana to start drinking the drink of the gods and immediately began to taste it herself. Nika even closed her eyes to better taste this miracle. The drink flowed like a hot stream all over the nymph's body. She was delighted to say that she had never tasted anything like it. Her mood immediately improved several times. The happy girls discussed the flavor of the amazing drink and decided that they should try another glass, because after one they could not taste it. The valet was pacing from side to side and nervously going through his options for talking to Radiana. He didn't know how to ask if she was all right, if it was clear to a fool that she was not. The valet blamed Prince Orazio for the way he had treated the poor girl. Gino clutched a green plant in his hand and could not dare to enter the girl's room. But then the valet heard a woman laughing loudly. He was seriously afraid that Lady Radiana had lost her mind. The valet immediately decided to see what had happened to the young girl. He ran to the door of the room and quickly opened it. But when he went inside, the valet's eyes stopped on an empty bowl. On the walls of the bowl were the remnants of a red drink. The nymph and Lady Radiana were sitting on both sides of the bowl. They were laughing merrily at all sorts of silly jokes. A red blush was visible on the cheeks of both girls. The nymph was the first to notice the valet. She greeted Gino cheerfully. The nymph decided to approach the valet, but her gait was not very steady. Nevertheless, the nymph made it to the valet and told him that their little valet seemed to have grown a little. She also invited him to join their fun. The valet guessed that the nymph was drunk and decided to see with his own eyes what the girls were drinking. He ran over to the empty cup and asked the girls what was in it. When Gino leaned over the bowl, he smelled a familiar aroma. He immediately realized that it was nectar, and they drank it all. And this amount is enough to make a deity fall off his feet. Lady Radiana noticed that the valet had not come empty-handed and asked him what he had really forgotten and brought her the papyrus. The valet handed the papyrus to Radiana, and she began to look at it with amusement. She looked at the papyrus and laughed. The young girl kept saying that she could not believe it. The confused valet looked at Lady Radiana, who was quite drunk. He did not know what to do with drunken girls. He had never faced such a test before. While the valet was looking at Radiana and deciding what to do next, 
the nymph had already fallen off her feet and was lying on the floor of their room. Suddenly, the valet felt the presence of his highness. He was so happy that Orazio could read minds that he decided to call him for help right away. The valet immediately decided to explain what had happened because he did not expect the girls to explain adequately. Gino told the prince that he was very glad to see him. Tara was sitting on the floor of her room crying and could not recover from the fiasco. The empress's words that the fate of the family was in her hands rang in her head like bells. While everyone was having fun at the festival and admiring the incredible fireworks, Tara thought only that whether the Pyro's family would continue to exist now depended only on her and that damn nymph. Meanwhile, the empress was in her chambers. She also decided to rest and think carefully about the situation that had developed after Radiana's appearance in Orazio's life. But while she had not yet found a solution to this problem, the empress decided to get rid of unnecessary witnesses who knew too much. So she called her guards and ordered them to kill all the nymphs present. The bloodthirsty Avaricha did not even blink while the guards killed the unfortunate nymphs. She continued to enjoy her dinner, and meanwhile the whole room was covered with the blood of the nymphs, who begged for help. The empress was furious that the arrogant Orazio dared to challenge her, Empress Povius. She also decided that she needed a stronger rhinum because the prince's power had grown. Her thoughts were disturbed by someone's presence. A vortex of blue appeared in the room, and the frightened empress turned her head in its direction. When the blue vortex appeared before Avaritia's eyes, she asked him who he was. And when he spoke to her highness and called her mother, she realized that Caligo had come. The empress was happy to hear the voice of her own son and asked how he was doing. Caligo replied that he was doing well and that he had a chance to get to her unnoticed. The empress immediately decided to tell her son about the situation. She said that they had very little time, but she was doing everything possible to get him back to Tesca. Caligo listened carefully to the empress's speech and replied, thinking that he would not be safe there. But the empress assured her own son that he need not worry about that. She would definitely do everything possible and impossible to make sure that Povius belonged to him. Finally, the empress added that very soon they would show the whole world that Orazio was a monster, and she had already figured out how to do it as soon as possible. At the festival, all the gods were sitting on their thrones. Orazio was also looking at the guests, but his eyes were blank and his thoughts were far away. He was constantly thinking about his beloved. A man approached Orazio and addressed his highness. He introduced himself. It was Valm Conium of the House of Pyros. This honorable man was Tara's father. Valm came closer to Orazio and said that he had come to beg for mercy, because his daughter Tara had been very rude and behaved indecently toward the nymph. Orazio looked more closely at the venerable man and asked only if he was really Tara's father. Tara's father blushed with shame. He never thought that in his old age he would ask for pardon because of his daughter's behavior. Valm said that she was still very young and immature. Orazio's older brother Saltus was listening attentively to this conversation. He also intervened and advised Orazio to accept the man's apology because they had no reason to be at odds with the Piros family now. Orazio thought about it for a while, listened to his older brother's words, and asked him whose apology he should accept. He did not think to forgive those who dared to insult his beloved. Then Orazio added that the father should give something to his daughter, and that something was an offer to come to Orazio when Tara agreed to become his concubine. Valm felt cold inside. He asked again if Orazio really meant that his daughter from the Pyros family was a concubine. This was something he had not expected to hear. Everyone understood that Tara was of noble blood. She also belonged to one of the main branches of the Pyros family, the Sincerum family. There had never been a case in history of such women becoming concubines. Orazio looked at Tara's father's reaction and suddenly asked him if he wanted to sell his daughter. He advised Woom to stop playing the caring father. Orazio also looked at Tara's father and added that his cheap lies would not fool anyone, so he should stop playing cheap comedy here. Drops of cold sweat broke out on Wam's forehead. He didn't even know what to say to such a straightforward and stern prince. He only said that he would never sell his own daughter. But Orazio was tired of listening to such stupid talk and hypocrisy. So he said that he was sick of it all and advised Baum to find another husband for his daughter. Orazio got up from his throne and was about to leave. Saltus asked him, frightened, what he was doing. Because they were not supposed to leave their moon of honor at the festival, 
but Orazio calmly replied that he was just defending what was rightfully his. Finally, he wished everyone a good evening and left. Orazio, of course, went to his beloved's room, especially since he heard the voice of the valet asking for help. But when Orazio approached the door, he noticed the magic that muffled the sound. This, of course, did not stop the brave prince, and he stepped on the edge of the magic spell. But when he opened the door, what he saw was surprising. There was an unconscious nymph lying on the floor near the door. At first Orazio thought she had been killed, but then he realized that she had simply gotten drunk to the point of losing her pulse. At the same time, his beloved Radiana and the valet were having fun. They were sitting on the windowsill, drinking alcoholic beverages and chatting about something. Orazio's eyes popped out of his head, because he never expected to see such a wedding here. He shouted his bride's name loudly. At the same time, Radiana turned to the prince. She had a red blush on her face, which clearly indicated that she was drunk. Her eyes were looking in different directions. She shouted joyfully that at last his highness had come to them. Orazio, on the other hand, was not happy with what he saw. The young girl immediately decided to get closer to the prince. When she began to approach, Orazio said that he was not in the mood for drunken chatter, so he should wait to talk. But Radiana replied that she was the most sober of all the sober. When Radiana approached her prince, something happened to her coordination and she lost her balance and fell on Orazio's shoulder. She bumped her cheek painfully against his highness. Radiana rubbed her cheek with her hand and said that she now had another bruise, right where the previous one had been. But it didn't hurt, and she even had a smile on her face. Then the drunken Radiana looked into her fiancé's eyes and said that she liked Orazio very much and that she could not do anything about it. Of course, her brain didn't want to say that, but her drunken tongue did. Orazio immediately softened because she had never told the prince how she felt. He went over to her and hugged her gently and said that of course she did. Then he looked into her eyes and asked her to tell him what else she wanted. He was ready to listen to her drunken chatter for ages because it was like a healing balm on his heart. His hands reached for her golden hair and buried themselves in it. He could smell her again, and his whole body was filled with sensations. An unbearable desire to hug her tightly played in his blood. He took her in his arms. Her heart was beating fast, and he could feel every beat of her heart. His lips leaned over her ear, and he whispered to her to keep talking and tell him more. When Orazio brought his beloved to his room, he poured himself a glass of wine. He did not forget about Radiana, although he knew that the young girl had had more than enough alcohol for one day. He looked at Radiana and told her to tell him about her life on earth. The young girl held the glass tightly in her hand and gathered her thoughts. Then, Radiana drank it all to the bottom to gather the courage to tell her story. While she was silent, Orazio looked at her carefully and said that the story was not very interesting so far. He wanted to understand her way of thinking and to understand the girl more. She meanwhile decided to start her story and said that the slave master beat her whenever he wanted. Radiana closed her eyes and remembered all the horrors that had happened to her in the past. Her skin felt cold, because those beatings happened every day. Her skin still remembered everything well. She said that sometimes the owner would beat her because she made baskets that were too strong, and sometimes because they were too weak. He always didn't like it, and was looking for the slightest excuse to let out his anger. Radiana counted the days when he didn't touch her, and counted only nine days. They were just incredibly fabulous days when her body didn't feel the touch of the gossip. Orazio looked at the young girl in displeasure. He had only heard her complain about being beaten, although he had actually expected to hear something else when he asked her to tell him something. Radiana could no longer hold back her emotions. Tears were streaming down her red eyes. She felt sorry for herself, sad, and hurt to remember all the abuse she had gone through. But then she suddenly opened her eyes and looked at the prince. She shouted loudly in the prince's face why he had not saved her. Orazio's glass almost fell out of his hand. He was simply shocked by his beloved's claims and asked her what she meant when she dared to make such a claim. She looked directly at him and continued that he was the sun god, but he was not there when Radiana needed to be saved. Why then did he appear when she wanted to die? She shouted right in his face that she was constantly calling the gods for help. Every day she begged for salvation, even when the monsters pushed her and cut her clothes. 
Then Radiana completely lost control of her emotions and punched Orazio's chest with her fist. She shouted, asking if he ever thought about the people who needed his help. She looked boldly at the prince and continued that probably at such moments he was too busy enjoying the prayers of greedy people. Radiana could no longer contain her anger and fell on Orazio's chest. She sobbed and said that he probably didn't care about the pain and suffering of the people who were begging for salvation. Orazio did not know what to say to Radiana's claims, so he just listened in silence to what the young girl wanted to tell him. Then he took her by the shoulders and put her in her place. He loudly told her to stop her hysteria because it was the alcohol that was doing all the talking for her. Radiana came to her senses and looked at Orazio. Tears were shining in her eyes. She looked at him and asked what he had done when he came into her life, when he appeared at the very moment when the young girl almost burned to death. And only the drunken valet and the nymph didn't care about the family showdown of the hot couple. They both slept peacefully after drinking alcohol and probably saw something pleasant in their dreams. But Radiana had no intention of stopping. She decided to dot the I's and cross the T's once and for all. So she didn't wait for Orazio to answer her. She told him that he had called her his thing and condemned her to eternal life. She was at the peak of her emotions, so she pointed her finger at Orazio and shouted loudly how he could call himself God after all that. But Orazio wasn't going to take any more of that attitude so he quickly grabbed her hand and pulled her to him. He realized that she was just drunk, so he took extra courage. His head was already very close to his beloved. Radiana instantly melted, and there was no trace of her previous courage. He leaned over her and gently whispered what she wanted now. Radiana did not understand the question and asked him what he meant. Orazio patiently repeated what she wanted from him now. Radiana looked at the prince in surprise. He repeated once more that the girl should tell him her most cherished wish, and he would fulfill it. The surprised girl took her hand away from the prince and asked him sternly what good it would do him. She still had a lot to say to Orazio, but she wondered if she should do it right now. She said that Prince Orazio had made her immortal, even though she hadn't wanted it at all, and now his energy was flowing inside her body. But then, Radiana realized the full value of his words. She looked at him and asked him if he had lied to her, that he would do everything she asked right now. Orazio sat down in his chair and loudly announced to the whole room that the gods never lie, so she could ask for absolutely anything. Radiana's face showed that she was hesitant to tell the truth. At that moment, Orazio was going over in his head what his beloved would say. But Radiana gathered her courage, clenched her hands into fists, and shouted that what she wanted most in life was to be free. Tears flowed from her eyes again, and she asked why she could not have the freedom that others had. The girl fell to her knees in front of his highness and continued to cry. She put her hands on his lap and begged him to fulfill her request, because otherwise she would wither and die. The crying Radiana also added that she did not want to be old forever. Orazio tried to reassure his beloved and said that she shouldn't worry about it because it wouldn't happen. But Radiana couldn't stop shouting at the top of her lungs that she just wanted to enjoy life and she was not satisfied with the role of a doll, so she asked him to fulfill her wishes. Orazio thought for a moment. He was very surprised by Radiana's wish. He did not understand why she asked for freedom. He could have given her the whole world, but she asked for some freedom. He thought that Radiana would wish for gold, land, or respect among other noble families. At the very least, he hoped to hear that Radiana would wish for revenge on those who had abused her for so long or on those who had sent her to certain death in the first place. But his beloved did not care about all these values. She only wanted to be free. He looked at the crying Radiana, who was kneeling in front of him and begging for freedom. Orazio thought about it for a while and said that his beloved would certainly get what she asked for, because he had already promised her. Radiana stared at Orazio for several minutes in amazement. She could not believe what she had just heard. It was her most cherished dream. So she screamed with joy, Immediately her expression changed and she began to tell her prince what she planned to do as soon as she was free. She was going to go to the distant forests. Radiana planned to settle down where there were many trees. Then she would set up a small house and gather berries in a basket. She would weave with her own hands. And every day in the afternoon she will go to the ocean. After all, its waters should give her a sense of freedom. In her dreams, Radiana often imagined this incredible sight so realistically 
that it seemed like she had been going on such walks for a long time. Radiana looked at the Horacio and added that the ocean she had seen was incredibly beautiful. Radiana fell on her knees to Horacio and hugged him gently. She was grateful to him for this gift, which she had never even dreamed of. Orazio quietly asked if he could just give her the ocean. He looked at his beloved and waited for an answer. But the girl said that she didn't want to own the waters. She just wanted to enjoy them peacefully in her free and quiet life. Orazio looked at his beloved Radiana and could not help but admire her beauty and purity. For the first time in his life, Orazio felt his mask crack into hundreds of small pieces.